Well, I, I think it just goes to the fact of like how much of a pussy Carl Weathers is. One day, I hope we can meet Carl Weathers so I can watch you go up and call him a pussy to his face because he's probably 70 years old right now and he would beat the piss out of you. I guarantee that. Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but they were sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane kicked ass. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we love when growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even remember what Blockbuster Video was? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your three hosts, Roger Roper, and alongside me, I've got Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And Gene Lyons. If I can change and you can change, everybody can change. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films from the 80s and 90s still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from four curated movie choices that the audience then votes on. And we break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, we will provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would need to take to get off your respective asses. So find a comfortable spot on the sofa and accompany us for a journey through our vast VHS movie collections. Gentlemen, this week's choices were from the Criterion collection of sports movies that came out during the 80s and 90s. Uh, What were the four choices, Big D? We had The Sandlot, Varsity Blues, uh, Rocky IV, and... Caddyshack. Caddyshack, correct. Yeah, so the movie that overwhelmingly won. It beat out Caddyshack, which I was completely not expecting to happen, was the 1984 film Rocky IV. Now, I have, it's been a while since I've seen this movie in its entirety in one sitting. I think what exists in my mind, but prior to me watching this, was just montages and 80s music, which isn't too far off from what the movie actually is. No, I can remember. You always ask, hey, when did you see it? Where did you see it? I vividly remember the movie theater, who I was with, the hijinks that ensued before and after the movie. And I even remember that Christmas getting this killer soundtrack on cassette tape. I was the happiest boy. What about you guys? I actually, so I was wrong. It's actually 1985, not 1984. Is that correct, Gene? That's correct. November of 85. Okay. Um, this was one of the movies where I don't think I saw it in the theaters. Again, it was a lot of movie watching on VHSs over at my neighbor's with the black box house. That's where I remember watching this movie and I watched it a lot, like a lot. And this was like Ray. I mean, Reagan was our childhood, right? This movie just screamed America. And like, uh, I think I remember like Ronald Reagan, like during his presidential, this was just after he just got reelected, right? So I remember him having like Sylvester Stallone like over at the house and I remember him like like putting this movie up on a pedestal, right? As as a as a way for relations to to get better between the, the Soviet Union and the in the USA. Yeah, this was a weird one because because Rocky 4 was so different from the other Rockies where 1 2 and 3 was about this, you know, long shot fighter from Philly and and very like small storylines right you know just about him it's very internal very family related and then this all of a sudden became like the international stage like out of nowhere rocky four is a creature unto itself and then in rocky five they just go back to the kind of the rocky one two three format yeah when you look at the movies that came out at that same time it was red dawn uh it was the reagan era we we had a perfect villain uh when we did uh, die hard we talked about the evolution of terrorists in american cinema and that in the early 80s into the 90s, it was Eastern European and Russian and then became Middle Eastern later. If you made Rocky today, then he might be fighting, you know, and some, you know, ISIS boxer. You know, so, or he'd be, what? He'd, be fight, he'd be fighting Someone's a North saying, Korean. He'd be fighting a North Korean. A North Korean. A North Korean. What? The biggest height of a North Korean average guy is like, what, five foot seven. Are you telling me they're not investing in the the finest synthetic testosterone and growth hormones, we don't know what's going on there. No, I honestly, I think this, you know, without getting in depth into the current political uh, landscape, 
I think this is like a great throwback. You know, like the Russians are the bad guys, the commie. Although I honestly thought that uh, Ivan Drago and his wife were sympathetic uh, individuals. I, I, I felt a sympathy towards them as characters. I felt that the guy, the real true villain of this movie was the government handler. No, I think, and Raj, I think it was intentionally done that way. Where was it? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the way I took it. Is that is that you know Drago, you know, comes out. He's very stoic, and 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 there's this. Uh, it's it's normal people caught in an international conflict, and I think that they did a really great job of of reflecting that. For the record, tallest North Korean, seven foot eight. Bam. Yeah, but he's not a boxer. How do you know? I don't it think anyone. Well I don't be. think anyone can box at seven foot eight. No, but but I I agree. I totally agree with you, Raj. Watching it now, you know, some thirty some odd years later, the Russians are very sympathetic. Drago is sympathetic. He's as much a victim of the Russian system as any of them. And finally, in the end, when he breaks and he says, "I'm fighting for me. I'm fighting for me," uh, I, I felt for him, and I almost wanted to do a fan cut version of this that shows Drago as the hero he potentially could have been. Yeah, so th- this movie, though, when watching it, looking back on it, you, I always just figured those guys were just bad. They were just bad. They were just villains. Now, at the time, like, it, it, was that just because of the political landscape? Even though at the time, like, what's going on behind the scenes, like, you know, they were striking deals to reduce nuclear arms, and then the Berlin Wall would fall, and then, you know, a few le- a few years later, like USSR. But this is at the, this is the time of the '80s that I can remember as being a kid of having drills in class. To you know, hide under your desk in the in the event of a nuclear fallout, and uh, and you were better dead than red. And uh, let's see what else. What other phrases? You know, uh, you know, co- the comment. Listen, I, this was the deep south in Florida where I lived. Hold on, I got to call bullshit. I'm no. older than both of you, and you're telling me you ran bomb drills? Oh yeah. No, this is not. Listen, it took a while for shit to like filter down to the south. Okay, so you may have stopped it back in New York or wherever you grew up or, you know, in the liberal elite north. But down, you know, with, you know, the true uh, patriots that we were in uh, Florida, uh, you would run drills uh, during third and fourth grade homeroom uh, in uh, Loretto Elementary School in Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, here's the thing, Raj. It could have been (laughs) that we saw a red threat coming from the east and that's why you remember these characters as being pure evil or it could also be the fact that you were five years old and so it's just they just seem like bad guys yeah and i'll give you because i'm a little older than you i I can remember like the 1980 olympics in lake placid granted i grew up in new york uh, and, and i remember my family around the tv and at that point the russians it was a very secretive uh country you didn't know much you you would see the athletes come in uh, and the Russian hockey team was devastating. It was that's why it was the miracle on ice. The U.S. team was made up of college kids and was supposed to have no chance. And for them to beat the machine that was Russian hockey was shocking. And at the same time, I remember that when the Russian shot down that commercial airliner, and there was a few times in my youth where I was truly afraid of the Russians. Uh, it was the the day after was the the miniseries that was on TV that went through a nuclear war. And I remember being afraid, but again, it was out of ignorance. We did, I didn't know anyone Russian. I didn't have the internet. You only saw the propaganda that we got here on US TV, which was the same thing going on in Russia. So it was, it was fear of not knowing. Well, I always thought like the propaganda growing up about the USSR was that they were better than us in everything because they were more committed to it, right? Whether or not that was forced by the government or not, they were just better at it. They they would just uh, and so I feel like Rocky Four is unfortunately like it is a it's a time capsule in America. But also I, I looking back at it now, uh, you know, years later, knowing that as an adult what I do now, I feel like this movie was more of a condemnation of our over excesses in America. I feel like there was some respect that was given to the Soviet Union and the way that uh, they're portrayed in this movie. Like, like there, there's a lot of dumb American moments here. I think that was intentionally put in there by Sylvester Stallone. No, we're looking that at that scene of excess in Vegas through the lens of 30 years. At the time, I remember everybody was like, fuck yeah, Rocky, woo, Apollo, yeah. 
Everybody was fired up. Now it's embarrassing. But Big D, people also do that with Rambo. First Blood, they they didn't understand it. They watched and they're like, "Fuck yeah, Rambo!" And in fact, the story is about you know returning veterans' inability to 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 reacclimate to society and the way society just abandons these people. And so you know, much like uh, like uh, Born in the USA is misinterpreted by tons of people. People can say "fuck yeah," but they don't know what it's actually about. I am with Raj on this. When I saw that scene, you can see the look on Rocky's face. He's looking around the room in Vegas going, this is absolutely absurd and embarrassing. And you've got a, it's supposed to be a fight. And this guy is an athlete who comes to your country to have an exhibition match. And you're dancing around and making fun of him. And, you know, it's it basically, I, I very much thought the movie was trying to convey it. I missed it the first several times I watched it. I never caught that. But as an adult looking back, I think it's very intentional. I agree. Rocky was upset with them making a mockery of the fight, but he was not upset with the total display of of American society. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He completely goes over there for revenge and decides he's not even going to get paid for this. There's nothing more un-American and more, you know, socialistic than saying, I'm going to go and fight this man uh, for no money uh, in their home country uh, because that is my duty as a uh, as an individual patriot. He's a communist boxer. Yeah, he's a communist boxer. He gives out beatings according to need. He went and trained. He went and trained on a collective farm. He became one with the. Uh... Anyway, we're diving way too far into this movie. Listen, this I feel like this movie has eight pages of script, seven pages of montages. Two pages of flashbacks. That's what this movie is. Yeah, it's a mix of MTV videos. It's like junk food. You yeah. Know, it's like you have a couple drinks, you order a pizza. Before you know it, the whole pizza's gone. You don't know what the hell happened, but you're somewhat happy and sleepy. Yeah. That's how I felt with this. It was an hour and a half of pure enjoyment. Granted, it was, <laughs> it was bad. It was flawed. The dialogue sometimes was laughable. Uh, the characters were realistic, but I enjoyed every damn minute of it. And now I'm just sleepy on the couch. I feel like they filmed 30 minutes and then they were like, let's stretch this out. We got to get to 90. How many more montages can we fit into this? But anyway, all right. So this actually big D it was a success. It was uh, one of the top 10 highest grossing films of 1985. Uh, the, the top list was back to the future with $210 million. Rambo First Blood Part Two, $150 million. Rocky IV, $127 million. Color Purple, 94. Out of Africa, Cocoon, Jewel of the Nile, Witness, The Goonies, and Spies Like Us rounded up the top 10 movies of 1985. Big D, let's roll the trailer. Today, the Soviet Union has officially entered professional boxing. This is not just an exhibition fight, but this is us against them. He would like to compete against anyone who is qualified. Drago is the most perfectly trained athlete ever. Whatever he hits, he destroys. He could have stopped the fight. He could have saved his best friend's life. I'll never forget you, Paul. But now, the one thing he can't do is walk away. Has the fight date been set yet? December 25th. Where? It's in Russia. Are you nuts? Miss Balboa, when will you be going to Russia? I'm not going to Russia. I don't know what you're talking about. He's had one professional fight, and one man is dead. To Pee he's going to have to kill me. Why can't you change your thinking? Because I'm a fighter. You can't win! Rocky 4, 
Milwaukee Four. All right, so Rocky IV is a 1985 American sports film written, directed by, and starring Sylvester Stallone. Rocky IV became the highest grossing sports movie and stayed there for 24 years before overtaken by The Blind Side. It's the fourth and most financially successful entry in the Rocky film series. So in the film, the Soviet Union and their top boxer make an entrance into the professional boxing arena with their best athlete, Ivan Drago, who initially wants to take on the world champion Rocky Balboa. Rocky's best friend Apollo Creed decides to fight him instead, but is fatally beaten in the ring. Enraged by this, Rocky decides to fight Drago in the Soviet Union to avenge his friend and defend the honor of his country, which he eventually does. So that's that's the plot of the movie. It's very simple. You know, um, what I liked uh, about the Rocky films were their simplicity. Gene, you had mentioned that uh, there was some over-the-top internationalism that went on. It felt like Rocky was a Superman going up against, you know, a David versus Goliath situation here. Uh, and he was like, you know, the whole country was behind him. But there were parts of this movie where I felt they tried to go back to their roots. Does that make sense? So, like, in Rocky Three, when he loses to Clubber Lang, he loses to Clubber Lang because he's overconfident. He doesn't take Mickey's advice and train hard. He lets distractions get him in, in, in the way. And knowing that, it makes it more plausible that when he goes to the Soviet Union, he's like out on this collective farm out in the mountains, and he he wants to be as far away from distractions as possible. Right. Not just that, but I mean, he shows that hunger and the fact that he's carried that on from Rocky Three and and in Rocky Four. But there's also these, you know, the hallmark of Rocky movies before this is that he's got these Sylvester Stallone has this incredible ability to have tender moments with people regardless of the quality of dialogue essentially in the sense that when he's with his son when he's with Adrian even when he's talking with uh, with Apollo Creed it's like his when he's quiet and he's actually like uh, being tender toward a person, he's really, really good at that. And I think a lot of people remember him just as Rambo yelling and shooting machine guns off. But the guy's got a, a very nice softness to him. Now, uh, so he's, there's a lot of these quiet moments. But in that scene that he has, and it's horribly written, but the scene that he has with Adrian on the stairs where he tells her like why he's got to go do this fight, he's expressing that he's still got that that hunger. There are many echoes, aside from the flashbacks, there are many echoes of previous movies in this, and I thought they did a brilliant job of carrying over the the spirit of the Rocky movies, but completely changing the game with this huge international bout and a guy getting killed and James Brown popping out with fireworks and booties. Yeah. So there's a lot to talk about this movie. Um, so... The way that we do this, if you're first time ever listening to Shat the Movies, is we will break down the plot for you. Then we stop, then we talk about it, then we talk about the next plot point. So it's better if you watch the movie and then listen to it. But if you haven't, we're going to run through the major plot points with you in real time. So, again, Ivan Drago. He is a Russian-Soviet boxer. He is the undefeated amateur. He's the world amateur champion. He is arriving in the United States with his wife, who's also an Olympic medalist in swimming played by Bridget Nielsen uh who's who guys man I tell you what euro babe right just totally still does it for me um as well as his team of trainers from the USSR and Cuba his manager Nikolai Kolov takes every opportunity to promote Drago's athleticism as a hallmark of Soviet superiority motivated by patriotism and an innate desire to prove himself Apollo Creed challenges Drago to an exhibition bout Rocky has reservations, but agrees to train Apollo despite his misgivings about the match. He asks Apollo whether the fight is against the Soviet or you against you. So we had mentioned that the movie was comprised of mostly montages, uh, some flashbacks, some training, music videos. Uh, That entire intro where they flashback through the last three Rockies. This wasn't the long after Rocky Three. What was the point of throwing that in there? Did they think we had forgotten the origin of Rocky and the, the relationship between him and Apollo? Did we need that? So I've got a couple of theories about this. First of all, I, it seemed at Rocky Four, the point that it was released, I think that they really were thinking this is it, right? That they're just going to do a big bang, like end of the thing and just make it a huge, you know, the the the, the ability of the Rocky franchise to just keep going, I think has stunned everybody. I mean, it's... it's to the point where I think in Rocky Balboa, this is now 30 years after Rocky won and he's still fighting. I mean, what's, what's going on here? So, uh, 
you know, I didn't have a problem with that. What it did, I think, that the, the plus side of that is that they were it allowed them to get a running start at the rest of the movie where they didn't have to explain much after that. So you established what Apollo and Rocky's friendship was. Um, you established, you know, like what his fighting style was, what it looked like to see him, you know, win and lose. Um, so I think that it was effective. And I was actually really on board with this until they get to uh, the scene where you see the, the the U.S. glove and the Soviet glove in the opening credits. And they're coming in. And I was like, man, this actually looks really good. I was like, did they remaster this? And then you saw what happens when you don't use CGI. Now, when we watched when we watched The Last Starfighter, you, you know, we were like, oh, this CGI is, is terrible. And it's the same era. You know, we're like, never use CGI. You should always do, like, practical effects. And then we saw what happened when practical effects go wrong. Those two gloves come together all shiny and cool looking. And then it's like someone set off, like, a, like an M60 in the background. And then they, like, threw some confetti in there. What was that all about? And one of the gloves falls off. You can see that the glove on the right-hand side, I don't remember which flag it was, just falls off. But we're talking this movie's a time capsule. I think it's a time capsule for boxing as well. I remember when boxing was a huge deal. Uh, I grew up in New York. I mentioned my parents had a place in the Catskills where Mike Tyson was from. So he was a local boy who my father and I used to sit on the couch and watch Saturday boxing when Mike was real young and he'd wear the white boxing trunks. And boxing was a big deal in my house. We talk about the VHS collection. I have every Mike Tyson fight on VHS that my father taped. So it was nice to go back to a time when boxing was big. But that being said, I don't remember a boxing movie where the boxing is less realistic and ridiculous. Every punch is a haymaker. There's, I think Rocky is knocked down six times in the final fight. Uh, Drago essentially hip checks him, throws him on the ground, runs over and knocks him down again. There was no rules that resembled anything close to boxing in this movie. Well, in doing my research, uh, Rocky four is actually one of the few sport movies that applied genuine sound effects from actual punches. So I always thought that was like bad because it sounds bad. It sounds like a, a Hollywood punch, but that's actual real punches. And uh, they use training methods created by boxing consultants and other uh, special effects to make the boxing look real. Now I agree. Like there, there's no, I've never been a boxer, but you can watch a real life boxing sparring and people put their hands up. No one's putting their hands up. No one's playing defense at all. The, the entire movie. Yeah. I mean, it blew my mind to see Rocky do a 15 round bout taking shots to the face from a guy who was punching at 2,100 pounds of pressure and not die. Weird. I think Rocky's entire defense of in that first round was to block all the punches with his face. He's not even attempting to put his hands up. They ring the bell, and it looked like the Ronda Rousey fight. Yeah, but if you don't block a punch with your face, how are you going to get that sweat flying? Because there, there's a lot of sweat flying. I think those, those uh, you know, they want to make it look pretty. Rocky's entire plan was, uh, I'll die in the ring, so I'll stand in front of him. He'll have to stand in front of me. Then he'll realize he might die. What was that? Well, that, yeah. I mean, look, if you're facing off against a Soviet soldier, and I think an officer at that, I think the best thing to do is question whether or not he's willing to die. Because <laughs> that's always going to work out in your favor. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's Let's go back. And talk about some stuff before the fight. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, we're getting way out of ourselves, guys. I mean, listen, we're only two or three montages away from the end of the movie, but, um, but yeah, no, we're reintroducing characters that you've loved. Uh, Adrian, uh, the hottest girl in Philadelphia. Uh, you have uh, her brother, Rocky's brother-in-law, uh, Pauly. You have uh, a eight-year-old uh, son, Rocky Jr. Is there and they're all they're all uh, they're all coming together because it's Polly's birthday, and one of the funniest oddest things about this film is the robot, uh, the robot that they give to Polly. Uh, it serves him beers. It speaks with a digitized uh, voice, like you know, like what you thought you know robots would talk like in the eighties, uh, and um, and it, 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 I think it becomes a de facto nanny throughout the like the movie. No, it becomes a, a sex bot very soon. 
Yeah, I mean, Polly straight up says that he's going to have the robot's wires tied. Like, that's freaking disgusting. And yeah, but I mean, look, uh, the, the robot's still the jam, dude. Like, I, I don't know about you guys. When I first saw this robot, I was like, need to have one immediately. And any robot in the 80s, any toy that even remotely looked like this robot, I had to have it. So, I mean, it captured the imagination of countless boys. Have you ever met a more ungrateful family member or house guest than Polly? He's living in a mansion. He does nothing but complain. Would you take care of that leech for this many years? He's like my father. No, I, I, I love having Polly around. Polly's great. But also, this is a, this is a classic situation of, of marrying into a family, and there's that brother. I mean, like, you just – I see this all the time. I've got uncles. I won't name names, but I've got uncles who, you know, are not blood relatives, and – uh yeah, I mean, they are they have to deal with some shit. So, during a press conference regarding the match, hostility sparks between Apollo and Drago's respective camps. The boxing exhibition takes place at the MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas. Apollo enters a ring in an over-the-top patriotic entrance with James Brown performing the full, the full version of Living in America, complete with showgirls. The bout starts tamely with Apollo landing several punches, several jabs that have no effect uh, on Drago, it soon turns serious, though, later that round, as Drago starts to retaliate with a devastating effect. By the time of the first round ends, Rocky and Apollo's trainer, Duke, plead with him to give up. But Apollo refuses to do so and tells Rocky not to stop the match. He pleads with him, don't stop the match. Whatever you do, Rocky, don't stop the match. However, Drago, Drago continues to pummel him in the second round, and despite Duke begging Rocky to throw in the towel, he reluctantly honors Apollo's wish. Eventually, Drago lands one final punch that knocks Apollo to the ground, killing him. In the immediate aftermath, Drago displays no sense of remorse, common to the, to the assembled media. If he dies, he dies. So, Apollo's decision to take this fight, uh, I think, was was you guys might laugh. I think it was a moving, uh, you know, depiction of of what it is to be a boxer. There's one of the things that's interesting about boxing is that unlike basketball or football, so like when you, you know, when you retire from football, you generally, you age or you have an injury or something and you, you go out, you might be a world champion or you might be on a terrible team. Basketball is kind of the same thing with boxing. It is very, very rare for a boxer to go out a winner. You, you are taken out of the sport by someone else. That's how fighting works. And so, Apollo, um, I think is, you know, it is his identity and he, it is a, is a statement on the fact that he'd rather be dead than irrelevant. You know, I think he knows, you know, going into this, that not necessarily he's going to die, that he's going to take a beating. I think that he's, he realizes that after the first punches kind of fly, he goes, Oh, you know, he realizes what's going on here. Um, I think beforehand he kind of didn't take it that seriously, but I think he definitely took it seriously after. Um, that scene between Rocky and Apollo, though, again, I know you guys kind of made fun of it. A- aside from Apollo calling Rocky the stallion about 80 times, I thought, and which makes sense, Sylvester Sloan wrote the thing, so why not call yourself a stallion in the movie? Other than that, though, I thought it was a very, you know, the, the dialogue is simple, but that's how real people talk. I thought that it was a good conversation to two of them and 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 carl weathers you know like if you look at him now like when he does like the the acting classes and stuff in uh in arrested development he's kind of like this laughable like you know like how could you learn anything from this guy i thought his acting was pretty good so you were okay with rocky all of a sudden becoming philosophical saying you know deep thoughts like you think uh you fighting against yous we gotta change sometimes it was comical i understand the conversation that boxers have where where they can't get out of it, where you never leave it, where the fighter is always in you. I understand that, but it was done in a clumsy way. I, I, for the rest of the podcast, Gene, I'm going to throw Gene in every time like Apollo did with stallion. Okay, Gene, you know, Gene, sometimes we got to do the podcast, Gene. Is that okay, Gene? I think that is, that's, that's just fine. But you know, look, I mean, again, I, keep going back to the fact though that it's not so much what's written is it's how he delivers it's there's a genuine character there and that's how rocky talks like he has thoughts he just does not articulate them that well it'd be much stranger if uh if he if he reacted in any other way here's my problem with that scene is he okay 
we get Rocky's a simple guy, right? He probably has some traumatic brain damage from years of in the ring and taking, you know, beats that he had, the beat that he has. And he wasn't that smart to begin with. The problem that I have is right after he go, does this, you know, philosophical line about uh, maybe it's you fighting yous. Uh, he, he he's typing up. He's like, uh, now your hands look like a mummy, and uh, you tough as snails. Uh, I never tried snails before. I see him in the garden, but you know when you think about it, like the biggest problem I didn't have is him philosophically uh, asking about snails in the garden or your hands look like mummies. It's this fight is an ex is it an exhibition? What is an exhibition match? Is it a is it a uh, let's just be sporting with each other? Uh, what, what what is this? An exhibition match means that okay, so you have boxing rankings and people have to agree to take fights, and then the boxing commit like the the body that governs boxing has to has to basically commission that fight. Say it's got it's it. okay, and it means something. It affects your ranking. And this should this doesn't affect anything. And the reason why is that Drago has never been in U.S. boxing, therefore he doesn't have a rank. He would have to start from the bottom. This is a, this is a fight that's not supposed to mean anything, and yeah, in that fight, typically because there's no rank at stake, because there's no uh, uh, title at stake, it shouldn't mean anything. It's like a preseason game, right? That's what it's supposed to be. It's like a preseason game. Okay, so so they're not so it's like the Pro Bowl of boxing, essentially. Is you know it's the All Star game of uh, NBA. Yeah, people aren't throwing you know hits. They're not throwing haymakers. No one's trying to hurt some, anyone. Like at the end, you're supposed you're supposed to be a goodwill match. But the other thing I don't understand is how long is Drago and his crew in the states for months? No, it's not. It's not very long, and that's a, that's a conversation that Rocky and and Apollo have. Is that Apollo hasn't had any time to train. He hasn't seen any film on the guy. He doesn't know anything about him, and he still took the fight. But again. In an exhibition, that shouldn't be that much of an issue because, you know, it doesn't really – it's not really supposed to mean a whole lot. And also, this guy's only an amateur boxing champion. So if you've watched amateur boxing, that's for points. That's not for knockouts. You got headgear and you're scoring points. You're saying this was for, you know, uh, it was an e exhibition. shouldn't mean anything. The press conference, the Russians are the ones who come out and they're friendly to me. They even mention that in Russia, Apollo Creed is a, a respected fighter. They say nothing but glowing things about their trip, and they're here as ambassadors of goodwill and sportsmen. Apollo is the one who turns it dirty by starting to talk about him, about how he's going to lose, and he's a, he doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah, I think that press conference was a metaphor for U.S.-Soviet tension, right? It's a, it's about miscommunication because what Carl Weathers is doing, what Apollo is doing, is he's trying to play up the fight like a showman, which is what you do in U.S. boxing. In professional boxing, it's about the show just as much as about the fight, right? You talk it up. You stoke tensions like Don King you know, would do, uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, infamous trash talker. And even now in today's world, you got you know guys like Conor McGregor. You're supposed to build that up. From a Soviet perspective, though, this is foreign. This is not. This is disrespectful, and that's what I think causes you know the tension there, and then it just escalates. So again, I, to me, that was the Cold War in a in a press conference. Well, again, this is where I thought, okay, this is one of outside of seeing the robot and the Lamborghini and the Datsun Z out front. Uh, and the, the little kid with the video camera, this is where I start to see, okay, this is American society at the time. They're laughing at this, this guy who is uh, a braggart, uh, and this is what American society wants and feeds our, our carnal capitalistic manners. And you have the nice, respectable Soviets over there who are like, uh, hey, you know, I just I want to be a good sportsman, and I want to box a good match. I want to talk one thing about the match here. So as we know, spoiler, Apollo dies. Was there no ringside doctor? Apollo is on the ground in Rocky's arms dying, and there's a photographer in his face saying, Rocky, is he dead? Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the problems that I had along when we talk about kind of the realism of this movie. Now, is the movie enjoyable? Yes. It, it, does it make sense? Not a lot. Why is there no medical staff on hand? You go to amateur bouts, you go to freaking wrestling, you know, college wrestling, and there's going to be at least a, some sort of a medical staff on hand. And even when Rocky goes to, to Russia, who's he got in his corner? Uh, who, who there is qualified to take care of him? Is something going wrong? <laughs> Duke. Duke is the only qualified individual. But Duke's not a he's not the stitch man, right? No, but I'll bet you Paulie has a whole bag full of pharmaceuticals. 
Yeah, Paulie's got a lot of needles that he carries around with him. But I guess the the issue that I have here is again, I'm looking at this from a situation where this is American uh, society at the time, and I think you know Sylvester Stallone wrote this in probably because he was having trouble with the paparazzi, and he's like the, the paparazzi is going to be the death of me or the death of someone that could be close to me, you know. And so, like, uh, that's what would happen in a situation like that is people only cared about getting the, the photographer shots uh, versus, you know, getting his best friend medical attention, which is why I died. Again, it's it, it's uh, an analogy for American society uh, in the mid 80s. So what I loved as a New Yorker, it's a small one that I guarantee you guys didn't even pick up, was one of the commentators in the Vegas fight is Warner Wolf. He was the local sports guy on the New York TV. And I remember seeing him and being like, wow, this is, this is so real. You know, they got real commentators, but did you ever remember hearing that Apollo was known as the count of Monte Fisto or the master of disaster? That's easily my favorite boxing nickname. As soon as I heard it, I did not remember it. And I just did like a fist pump in the air. There's a lot to like about this. While we're talking about things that didn't make sense though, did you notice big D that when Apollo is yelling at Drago, during the match and he's going i want you i want you he's got no glove on his hand it's a finger and i'm like what what is going on here and so i I, you know i i turned to uh my girlfriend i go i go hey uh did you just notice he didn't have uh and she goes yeah he probably just took it off no 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 you don't just take your gloves off you're taped up as as raj said like a mummy your your hands are taped up before those gloves go on and once those gloves are laced up and inspected you do not take those gloves off so oops on that but Pluses. Let's talk about pluses. While you guys shit all over this, I'm going to tell you some things that were really good about this fight scene. First of all, James Brown. Summer of 86, living in America was my jam. Weird Al covered it as living with a hernia. Also my jam. Love both of those. The soundtrack, aside from that, that pulsing synth and that like exhaust sound when, when the camera's panning across a sweaty Dolph Lundgren, like that gets you pumped, man. Like it was, it was ahead of its time. How do you think, because again, I love it. I think the soundtrack is fantastic. So I Googled to find out top, you know, rated soundtracks of all time. I expected this to be up there because everyone knows every song. The movie would not be the same without it. It wasn't even on the top 200. It didn't even uh, crack number two on the U.S. charts that year. So we now have a love for it. But do you think that the movie would be anywhere near what it is? without this soundtrack. I do as well. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, the musical score for Rocky IV was composed by Vince DiCola, who would later compose one of my favorite movies of all time, Transformers, the animated movie. If, if there are scenes where the music mirrors Transformers to a T, like when uh, Unicron is being introduced to uh, Megatron. That's the same synth sound as when Ivan Drago is being introduced in Soviet Russia. Um, but when you talk about the fight scene between Apollo and, uh, Ivan Drago, uh, Stallone has claimed that Dolph Lundgren, who plays Ivan Drago, this is his second movie, his second Hollywood movie. He nearly forced Carl Weathers, who played Apollo Creed to quit in the middle of filming. Um, during the fight at one point filming the scene, Lundgren tossed Weathers into the corner of the boxing ring. Weathers shouted profanities back at Lundgren. Uh, while living the ring and announcing that he was calling his agent and quitting the movie. Only after Stallone forced the two actors to reconcile did the movie continue. This event caused a four-day work stoppage while Weathers was talked back into the part and Lundgren agreed to tone down his aggressiveness. Now, Carl Weathers is not a small guy. These three dudes were ripped. They were lubed up. They were pumped up. They looked like sculptures you would see in Rome. They, they They were some ripped dudes. Well, I, I think it just goes to the fact of like how much of a pussy Carl Weathers is because Sylvester Stallone also stated that during the original punching scenes filmed between he and Dolph Lundgren in the first portion of the fight are completely authentic. Stallone wanted to capture a realistic scene and Lundgren agreed that they would engage in legitimate sparring. So while Carl Weathers is threatening, you know, his agent is going to walk off and quit the movie. One forceful punch with Stallone that he took realistically from Lundgren, who is at the peak of his physical prowess caused Stallone's, uh, his heart uh, up against his breastbone, causing his heart to swell. Stallone suffered from labored breathing and blood pressure over 200 and had to be rushed, flown from the set in Canada to St. John's Medical Center in Santa Monica and was forced into intensive care for eight days. So while Stallone is in a fucking hospital, 
suffering from an enlarged heart. He didn't quit the movie. He really was Rocky. Now, 12 missed work days. I bet there was probably some more to the script that just didn't want to get filmed or couldn't get filmed because there was like 12 stop days. One day, I hope we can meet Carl Weathers so I can watch you go up and call him a pussy to his face because he's probably 70 years old right now and he would beat the piss out of you. I guarantee that. But let's go back to the movie here. We talked about that James, the James Brown song was played in its entirety. They don't even wait three minutes before we get the driving montage with No Way Out, they play the entire No Way Out also. That's almost eight minutes of music. So basically, Big D, what you're saying is uh, right after Drago kills Apollo, Rocky announces that he has to fight. He has to avenge Drago. And they hold another press conference where he says, I'm going to fight Drago. Paulie says some pretty you know, ludicrous, dumb American stuff. Then also uh, the the Russian trainer starts getting quite racist that he says it's evolution, you know, and that that Rocky, you know, doesn't have the genetics that he can't compete with a more perfect man. Uh, but, but Rocky's a bit of a dick that he goes and makes this big life decision without consulting Adrian. Adrian's been there by his side the whole time. The blind sider by this is bullshit. But yeah, he comes home. They have the conversation on the stairs. He immediately gets into his car, another, you know, Rocky uh, in memoriam flashback of, of the fight where we see Apollo die about four times. This movie liked to remind the audience of what it just saw five minutes ago. Perfect explanation for this, guys. Pay attention to the one key thing that you guys kind of skipped over, which was Apollo's funeral. It was about five seconds long, right? There's a reason for that. They went through Apollo's funeral, and at that time, think about when someone you love died, right? And you're at the funeral. Your head, your mind is blank, right? You're not processing. And then later that night, maybe, you're driving your car, and then the memories start to come. This was a conscious decision, I believe, to be realistic about when you process and how you process your grief. You know, Rocky's not processing it at the funeral. He's processing it in that car. And if you notice, there is a parallel where... He sees uh, Apollo falling and dying, and he sees himself falling and dying. This is a reflection upon his own mortality. If you guys, yeah, you're rolling your eyes, but I don't know if you caught it. No, no, I, I definitely completely caught it. And there's even a few scenes in there of Mickey, which was one of the few close people in his life who he loved. So, yeah, I clearly got that. But my problem is we got it. You don't need to then have a three-minute driving montage to then beat us over the head with it. Yeah, it was a little repetitive. You know what I forgot to talk about was uh, the product placement in this movie. Fucking fantastic. The Hugo Boss shirts that they're all wearing. Like, how boss is that? Like, and then the Toomey luggage when they're, they're when they're heading out to Russia. But, but here's the problem that I have when you talk about realistic. Like, so funeral. Then it cuts to some uh, montages of magazines covers basically showing the audience that Rocky is going to fight, but it's in Russia. They have the news conference. Then he comes home and we're supposed to believe that Adrian still doesn't know that he's going to go fight Drago in Russia. How has he kept this from Adrian? Like she, just by turning on the television, she would see this or by going to uh, buy a newsstand. Is Adrian the most uh, absent minded individual in all of America? I don't think so, Raj, but I do agree that sh- that they could have condensed this a great deal by just skipping the clippings and had the reveal be during his conversation with Adrian that basically he says he's going and she- she's the first to know. You know, I think that would have solved both these problems, the problem that Big D's having, the problem that you're having with the way he handled the whole thing. And, you know, sh- she has some great insight, too, where she goes, you know, even if you win, Apollo's still gone right there. The movie should be over. Like, all right, <laughs> you're right. You know, he's dead. Why would I go die? This guy doesn't fight by any rules. Uh, the referees are definitely not going to help you out. And I'm not getting paid for this. This is stupid. I just don't understand why Rocky was the only one that had, like, in, in a boxing ring, is there only one guy that's allowed to, to throw the towel? If Duke is Apollo's, like, father, suppo- like, he is his almost like adopted father. Like, he says in the movie, I raised up. How is Duke not taking the towel from, from, from a, a stunned Rocky and just throwing that into the ring? Makes no sense. I think we're led to believe it happened really fast and that he didn't have time to get it. But I don't want us to dwell on this too much because we're getting to possibly the best 40 minutes 
of of 1980s montage training fighting fire me up you know i had a problem with you said your heart's on fire but once we start getting to russia the music and the training made me want to jump off the couch uh go pick up a spare tire out of my garage and start doing lunges down the street am i alone in this no you're not so drago's camp agrees to an unsanctioned 15 round fight in the soviet union on christmas day an arrangement meant to keep drago from the threats of violence he has been receiving in capitalist uh, America. Rocky travels to the Soviet Union without Adrian, only with Duke and his brother-in-law, Polly to accompany him. Which, by the way, why the fuck are you bringing Polly? You know, the robot would have been a better sparring partner or a, a better companion to fly to Russia with. Yeah, but who do you want to live the kids alone with, the robot or Polly? Yeah, the robot. Yeah, definitely. So to prepare for the match, Drago uses uh, a very high-tech equipment, steroid enhancement, and a team of trainers and doctors monitoring his every movement. Rocky, on the other hand, throws heavy logs, chops down trees, pulls an overloaded slow sleigh, jogs in heavy snow with treacherous icy condition, and climbs a mountain where he yells Drago at the top. Uh, Adrian arrives unexpectedly to give Rocky her support after initially refusing to travel to the Soviet Union because of her doubts on his fighting chances. Her presence increases Rocky's focus and enhances his training. This entire scene, as as Big D said, this entire sequence was awesome um you know i i really got pumped up about it too uh in the burning heart when they're like when they're landing in siberia it's just such a very literal theme song like i had the caption on i go oh this is actually like telling me the whole story of what's going on but what, what gets really interesting is that you know there's this pitting of rustic american frontierism versus russian technology right so you got like this you know, which which is fitting because the thing, the whole thing was filmed in Wyoming. But you know, but basically, uh, this was meant to to really, I th- I think, trigger uh, an American sense of of pride and simplicity, right? And that that we just you know just believing, and then also you get finally the reveal that in fact uh, that Ivan Drago is is doping. I, I I imagine the inventors of CrossFit watched Rocky Four one day and they were like, you know, fuck it, let's just do it. Let's get that old tire. Let's get that old, you know, uh, rock, let's get some rocks and let's just pick them up and put them down. And, and and let's let's get a sled. I'll put some weights on it. And then you just move back and forth in the parking lot. This is this is CrossFit before CrossFit. Yeah. So we can all agree that Rocky is ripped. He is jacked. His his winter Siberian CrossFit's working. His training is only missing one thing. Boxing. You know, sparring would help him get ready for that boxing match. So if he's going on, you know, a beach vacation to Cancun, yeah, he's doing a great job. But you might want to spar. By that rationale, though, Drago also is not doing. He all he's doing is punching the same guy over and over again and basically killing him. I would hate to be his sparring partner because that guy's just getting hit in the forehead and the jaw. Uh, my favorite part of Drago's montage, other than the fact that I thought they did a really cool job showing like all the technology when they're. When he's like, you know, with all the digital outlays and the 8 bit, you know, thermal imaging and stuff like that, that was really cool in combination with the synth. I mean, the movie had a very cool look going for it. But if you notice, when he's running around that track indoors, why is there a spotlight following him? I was watching this and I'm like, who would miss a six foot five Swede running around in white tights? Like, you know where he is. What's the spotlight doing? Also, would you line the track with the punching bags? How many times do you go jogging and then like mid sprint, you got like lunge and punch him. But again, that was Drago style. Big D, not just punching bags, speed bags. Like speed bags is about rhythm and timing. Running by and hitting a speed bag makes no sense at all. But I will say this, that uh, when I was training uh, in boxing at POW uh, in Chicago, uh, shout out to POW kickboxing in Chicago. One of my favorite things to do is if we would do laps around the room is I would always <laughs> hit that speed bag with one. End. I think the speed bag was, I don't know if it was every, I think it was just there. And so he just saw it and hit it. Maybe it, maybe a hint to how he would in the future kind of become his own man. Yeah. So in the beginning and during this training montage, they showed the Soviet uh, technological uh, superiority by that punch machine. Isn't that the same one that you see douchebags hitting at uh, like the lodge in your, whatever your downtown metropolitan area is that you live in? There's actually one at the Gid, the Grid Games and Growlers in Mesa, Arizona, and uh, you got to really be careful though, with your aim on that thing because everything around it is solid metal. So if you miss that that one bag that me- that measures the pressure, you're going to hit. And I've seen people break their hands, not at the Grid, but at other places. 
I just love I just love the guys. This is big in Orlando, Florida, Big D. Uh, uh, we would go out and we'd just see these assholes just spend their entire evening not talking to girls, not, you know, uh, having a good time with their buds. They would be over there and they literally like they had just gotten out of the gym and they had to just hit shit. Do you ever have anyone like that in your in your group of friends? So you and I have an Asian doctor friend. Why can't you just say we have a doctor friend? Because I want him to know that we're talking about him. <laughs> how, how many other doctor friends do you have that listen to this podcast? I have several. Fine. So, Roger, you and I have a, a, a doctor friend. How yes. tall do you think he is? I have five, nine, five, ten. He, and he's very slight build, but he has a, a, a hammer kind of spin move that he does. So I've been out with him a few times where you see these douches dumping $30 into the machine. He comes over, drops 50 cents and demolishes them. It's the last time they play for the night. He's he's basically he's it's all it's all in the the form right he's basically yes. uh, the Texas tornado from the WWE he does a little twirl and yeah, does all that um, but in 2012 the Olympians uh, USA Olympians uh, Michael Phelps and Ryan Lochte noted that the training sequences in Rocky IV inspired them to use a cabin similar to what the resourceful Balboa utilized in the middle can you just see the two morons using similar training techniques. You had mentioned earlier that Stallone was possibly making a, a commentary about American excess. And it's clear that Rocky's blue collar work ethic is earning the respect of the Siberian locals. Uh, the guy who's in charge of the house he's in, he's kind of, you know, nodding at him, watching him as he's chopping wood. I think Rocky is showing that Americans aren't the capitalist pigs that they're portrayed in, you know, the Russian magazines and the propaganda. This is where Rocky starts to turn the tide and start to earn the respect of the Russian people. Did you see that? Yeah, absolutely. And he hinted at it earlier when in the conversation with Adrian on the stairs at home where he said, you know, the car and the house and all this stuff, this isn't everything. You know, that there's that there's something more to that. And, you know, I think they're trying to reinforce that through this uh, through this montage. You see yeah, the old Siberian villagers kind of smiling and. So Drago is introduced with an elaborate patriotic ceremony in Ru in Moscow that puts the home crowd squarely on Drago's side and against Rocky. In contrast to his match with Apollo, Drago immediately goes on the offensive and Rocky takes a fierce pounding. Drago even throws Rocky around the ring with impunity. Rocky comes back towards the end of the second round. A right hook inflicts a cut just below Drago's left eye that silences the crowd and prompts Rocky to continue punching Drago even after the bell rings. While Duke and Pauly cheer Rocky for his heroism, they remind him that Drago is not actually a machine, but a normal man. Ironically, Drago comments that Rocky is not human. He is like a piece of iron, with his own corner reprimanding him for being weak in comparison to the small American. So this is the first time that basically you... Like, this was like uh, Mike Tyson's punch out. When you first get, like, that first punch uh, on the uh, Soto Popensky, right? He had the glass jaw. I feel like that's what happened here. Like, this is the first time Ivan Drago has ever been cut. Yeah, I mean, it follows, I think, along the pattern of every Rocky fight we've ever seen, right? Where he comes in, he's getting beat at first. And then, I mean, it's a it's a formula we've seen a lot of times. But I think that, you know, you mentioned the sound of the punches and the way that these things are choreographed. I still found myself against my better instincts, like getting really into this and like my pulse was accelerating and I got tense. And like, I know I've, dude, I've seen this movie a million times. I know what's going to happen. Why does it still affect me that way? Yeah, I kept thinking back to Ivan Vanko from Iron Man 2. You know, what's the famous line he says in there? He says, you know, if you can make God bleed, uh, people will start to have less faith and the sharks will circle. By making Drago bleed, that's the beginning of the end. But I'm more worried about, about Stallone. We live in an age now where concussions, you know, are really a major concern for any contact or X game sports. or No one is looking out for Rocky's well-being. Rocky is telling his his Duke, I'm seeing triples. You know, my my vision is blurred. This is a man who suffered a head injury. And Duke, instead of saying, hey, maybe we should you know, call the fight after, you know, his son, Apollo, has just died from a head injury. He tells him, punch at the one in the middle. Who's looking out for poor Rocky? What I want to know is how Rocky takes all this damage to the face and somehow his mouth and nose are just like left alone. He gives a perfect speech at the end. And also his nose is not in any way broken. His face should be, I mean, 
I felt like in earlier movies they did a better job of showing the damage to each other's faces. He had like a little cut over his eye and a swelling. It, it didn't seem too bad. Well, the two boxers continue their battle over the next dozen rounds. Yet another montage uh, with Rocky holding his ground despite Drago's powerful punches. His resilience rallies the previously hostile Soviet crowd to his side, which unsettles Drago to the point that he shoves off Cole, uh, shoves, he chokes Cole off and then shoves him out of the ring for berating his performance. Uh, in the last round, Rocky briefly tries the rope a dope tactic against Drago, a tactic that successfully worked against Clubber Lang. However, this tactic was not working on Drago. Rocky then la- lands five rapid punches into the gut knowing that Drago was slightly weak in the gut, followed by a dozen punches to the face. This dazed Drago and caused him to fall onto the canvas, winning by knockout to the shock of the Soviet uh, political elite with the fake Gorbachev up there in the, uh, in the, in their arena. Well, this is, this is BC place. This was filmed uh, in Vancouver in their previous arena that they had before BC place was built. So the real victory here is, as Big D mentioned, it's making Drago fight for his own interest. He made Rocky made a capitalist out of him, right? Where he where he shoves off uh, Koloff, as you said, and then kind of says, "I'm I'm fighting for me. This is for me now." And you know that that part of it that was that was the real victory in, in my book. W- win or lose, Rocky got through to to Drago and, and made him feel something. Yeah, he earned Drago's respect. That Drago saw the work he had put in, how hard. Uh... You know, a, a true champion he was. And that last interaction they have before the last round where he says, to the end. So this was no longer U.S. versus Russia. This was Rocky versus Ivan. And when Rocky wins, he takes this opportunity to to put a nice bow on it of everything that we've learned. And he says, you know, it's very important, you know, that if I can change, you can change, we can change. And it's better that two people fight to the death or then, you know, 20 million or 2 million. Uh, and, and are we led to believe that Rocky could lead us to world peace? And uh, did he bring down the wall? Well, there are scholars that state that uh, Drago's ultimate defeat and the Soviet crowd's embrace of Rocky represents a crumbling of the Soviet Union. That's what some scholars have said. I don't tend to believe that necessarily. I believe these uh, scholars have, but, but I do believe that this, um, throughout the entire ma- th- throughout the entire movie, again, we've talked about this in the beginning. I believe that this is, it was in, the intent of the script was to bring people together through sport, uh, not necessarily paint the Russians, the, at least the Ivan Drago and his wife as villains. It was more or less the factors that play behind them that were that were driving them and they were just uh being good soldiers even though uh Br- Bridget Nielsen's character says I hope that uh, someday our husbands can be friends we're, we are just sportsmen we are not soldiers I don't know but you know we've t- been talking about this and you think I'm being harsh on the movie I would turn around right now and go back and start it again and watch it so it, as many problems as we have this is one of my favorite movies it is awesome I, I, I want to go download the entire soundtrack again because it just fires me up. This movie was was great. So at the end of every movie, we promise we give, uh, we break out our shat meter and we tell you how many wipes this movie would take to get off of your, uh, your Soviet Union. Uh, Gene, we'll start with you. How many wipes would you give this movie? Recalling that a one wipe is a nearly flawless movie uh, and five wipes is you have just uh, exited the sizzler on the final night of uh, their uh, where they've got to just get rid of all their food. For me, this is a uh, 2.5 wipes to get me off the Soviet Union. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. I think that it, it, it's got problems. Obviously, um, there's some issues. I can't say that it, it holds its own uh, with uh, with movies as good as say you know, Die Hard. Um, it's not it's not quite there. But at the same time, um, it does. It did a big job. Like I mentioned earlier, it's taking the Rocky franchise from one, two, and three, and and bringing it into a much bigger stage with a lot of a fanfare. And I think what I noticed the most about this movie is I didn't forget a single scene of this. So this is you know I saw this the first time when I was five years old, and now I'm 36, and I still remember every single scene and sequence, which was kind of amazing. So to me, um, it's a classic. It, it deserves its place among the greats uh, from the 80s. And uh, and I loved it. So yeah, two point five. Big D, what would you give this? 
think I want to give it like a one and a half. I, I, I truly love it. I think it encapsulates everything that is 80s. And I might just go turn around. You know, I got 20 hours left on my iTunes rental of the remastered edition. I might go, I might get wild, go pour myself a drink and go watch it again. One and a half wipes. Yeah, this movie is complete shit. This movie is terrible. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the equivalent of McDonald's, uh, in terms of, uh, theatrical, uh, cinematic, uh, you know, movie going experiences. Uh, it's the value meal at the bottom of your Walmart, uh, uh, happy meal. That's exactly what this movie is. I, I listen, it's fun. It's great. You feel bad after watching it. Uh, but for some reason you're hungry right after and you want to watch it again. That's, that's the situation. Uh, so for that reason, I'm, I'm going to give this uh, three and a half wipes. Uh, it's it's not it's not a great movie. It's it's not even really a movie. It's montages. Uh, it, this is the MTV musical that we never knew we wanted, with a little bit of boxing sprinkled in there. Uh, that so three and a half wipes plus yours divided by three. Uh, oh God, that can't be right, is it? One one and a half, two and a half, and a three and a half. I'd actually like to change my uh, my rating to two based on what? your rant. Yeah, based on your yes. rant, you've pushed yes. me more toward two. More towards you like it? <laughs> yeah. All right, you jerks. All right, so this so this movie overall is a two point three wipe movie. So there you have it. Yes. Rocky four. Listen, if you want to watch a good Rocky movie, go watch Creed. I want to ask you this, Raj. In 30 years, will we be talking about Creed? Yeah, Creed's a great movie. Hell no. Listen, it's very easy to remember montages. Don't hate because it's a 2.2. If you're going to if you're going to keep talking about montages, let's talk about this. How much this movie affected Team America World Police. The song montage showing a montage was clearly clearly based on No Easy Way Out. This is, I mean, that they're at voice when their guy sings like this, you know, or, or, or now you're a man. That's definitely based on Rocky Four. So, I mean, think about its, its pervasive influence and profound and lasting influence on American culture. All right. There you have it. Well, that is the end of our review of Rocky Four. Thanks so much for uh, getting through that with us. Uh, Gene, if they want to follow us on social media, how can they do that? We are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook as Shat the Movies. Also, if you'd like to uh, get in touch with us via Snapchat, we are Shat on TV, which is our joint account between this and, and our other podcast, Shat on TV. Yeah, speaking of Shat on TV, we're over there doing uh, Taboo, which is playing on FX and BBC One. So if you uh, you like what we do here, try check us out over there, Shad on TV. Um, you if you have a, a suggestion for a movie or a movie you'd like us to do, you absolutely feel like you want to hear uh, our voices review your favorite movie. Uh, you can email us. We're hosts at shatthemovies dot com. Big D, what else? So this week, you know the the movies we did were sports related. Uh, the poll that's up there right now for next Thursday's review are uh, military action, all from 84, 85, 86, and they are all dynamite. We have uh, Commando from 1985 with Schwarzenegger. We have Top Gun with Tom Cruise from 1986, Red Dawn from 84, and First Blood Part Two from 85. And right now, surprisingly, Commando and Top Gun are tied at 36%, with Rambo at 21%, and I can't believe Red Dawn. Only 7%? I thought that would have been a runaway. Red Dawn's a terrible movie. Uh, yeah, so please get your votes in. Go to shatthemovies.com. You can vote for it there. Please vote for Commando. Also on Shat the Movies, uh, we do have a little box where you can type in your name and get a shout-out from us on the podcast. Uh, this week's shout-out goes out to Janine. Uh, thanks, Janine, for uh, sharing with us, subscribing to our uh our emails and um, and and being support of the podcast it means a lot to us. Always be sure to also, if you get the chance, uh, write us a review on iTunes or SoundCloud or wherever you write reviews. Yeah, we're everywhere. Fine podcasts can be found, and a five star review really helps us out. Also, sharing on your social media really helps us out. So, um, if there's no other further announcements, we'll go ahead and we'll close up this week's episode. Get ready for military themed action movies. Get your votes in by next. 
Tuesday so that we can record on Wednesday and release on Thursday. On behalf of my two co-hosts, Gene Lyons and Big D, I'm Roger Roper. We will see you next time at the movies. At chat the movies. At Don't go into the restroom after we do. I must break you. Yeah.